Hi there, welcome to No Nonsense Whiskey. My name is Vim PF, and on today's episode, we're doing another re review. My second of 2020, in fact. This here is the Glenmorangie, the original. I covered this almost, or well, actually over, probably two years ago now, something uh, like video number 111, very early on technically. So very interesting to be able to try this again. I'm guilty of actually not having this in the cabinet since then, so I'm really fortunate that a buddy of mine bought me this as a gift fairly recently. As you can see, I've been tucking into that and enjoying it. So it's good to do these re-reviews. I've often said that although I don't tend to buy bottles uh, a second time, just mainly because there are so many bottles to buy that I want to bring original content to you guys, if I get given a gift of a bottle, uh, then I will definitely 100% do a re-review of it, especially if it's been a couple of years since I've tried it to see how my kind of palette has changed, if it has at all, or if the liquid has changed, or if it's got more expensive, that sort of thing. So in any case, good things to know is that this is pretty much the same as it ever was. And one of the hardest things that a distillery and the staff there, and kind of the master blender, if you will, the whiskey creating communion within a distillery, one of the hardest things they have to do is produce the same liquid batch on batch, year on year. Now, obviously, there's going to be variations between each batch, each barrel, which is where the blending comes into play when you get so many barrels together and you have to try and create this, this flavour profile that bleeds across. Now, the interesting thing about that is that although you could very, I say not easily per se, but it's more, it's easier to make one bottle taste like another bottle and that's it. But to make it taste like the same throughout the decades is a whole nother challenge. And sometimes those liquids tend to change subtly year on year until you can get two decades apart and there'll be totally different liquids. A great example, I think, of that maybe not in the same situation, is something like Johnny Walker Red Label, which used to be uh, a mainstay in the, the early part of the 1900s. Times have changed now, and it's it's kind of low in the pecking order for me a little bit. I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's not very nice whiskey, because I know a lot of people enjoy it, but for me, I don't really like it that much, uh, and I wish I could have tried something like 100 years ago about how what it was like then. Maybe they made it differently, I don't know. In any way, this is relatively the same liquid as it was a couple of years ago, which I think is pretty exciting stuff. Also, it's an age statement whiskey, which I know a lot of people enjoy. I don't tend to be too worried about that, especially when there's other things on the on the table here, like you kind of 40% and probably added colour. Again, same as last year. It doesn't state it anywhere on the literature that it isn't. So you kind of assume that it is a little bit. And it's also worth noting that this is still first fill and second fill ex-bourbon barrels. It's all pretty good, it's all pretty consistent over the years. Let's have a look in the glass and see what we've got. Cheers, on the nose then. Now for me, uh, of course, this is a very light and accessible whiskey. Very light vanillas, some honeys. And on the back end, a little citrusy notes. Let's try on the palette. Now, this is one of those whiskies that translates nicely from the nose. Lots of vanillas, lots of honeys, lots of citrus. For me, on the back end, there's a kind of spicy element to it, a pepperiness, a kind of almost kind of clove in nature, which kind of carries on over to the finish, which is not overly long. It's kind of medium-ish, very peppery uh, and very just light and easy drinking. One more sip. I have to say my opinions on this are mirrored to my opinions two years ago. It's a very light, accessible whiskey. It isn't where I started my whiskey journey, but it's where I would recommend a lot of people should start their whiskey journey if they're looking to get into it. Personally, I started my journey on really rough blends like Famous Grouse and that sort of thing. N not typically what I would recommend for somebody who uh, was looking to get into whiskey and enjoy it, because that's a that's a that's a tough kind of baptism of fire almost. This is really where you want to start, I think. Now, I know a lot of people out there are lucky and their palates allow them to try peat right from the off. Not everyone's like that. I certainly wasn't. So this continues to be a mainstay. I'm glad I've got it in my cabinet again, because as I said earlier, I don't tend to buy bottles twice very often, even when this is on deal. Let's say this was 20 quid in my supermarket. That's 20 quid I could spend on a bottle that I haven't covered yet. Good example. So when I get given a bottle of this, it's with a grateful eye because I get to try something like this again. 
And as I said two years ago, same situation here. This is great as kind of a, what I would like to coin as a guard whiskey, a guilt-free whiskey, and a bit of a palate resetter, something to go back to when you've tried a load of awesome stuff, just to remind yourself where you've come from and enjoy and enjoy a kind of really light, tame whiskey of an evening without being stressed out or having to do any kind of tasting notes or anything like that. Perfect.